Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Susan Hegard, I'm president of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, or MEC. Um, I am unmuted right now, um, but I will stifle myself and mute myself um, a little bit later on as appropriate. Um, thank you for joining us for our first uh, Zoom, um, uh, Zoom gathering. Um, one of the things that the Midwestern Higher Education Compact is known for um, is our convening capacity. And in this um, new era and place in which we find ourselves, we're going to be do doing some more convening um, remotely. Typically, we might have done this in a, on a webinar, but we try, decided to try Zoom because one of the cool things you get to do now, uh, Senator Nesva, where am I right now? Can you tell? <laughs> it, uh, it looks like you, uh, yeah, you are speaking somehow suspended from the floor of the inside of the dome of my Capitol building. <laughs> <laughs> Your camera's on the floor. <laughs> That's right. All right. So um, I'm really pleased this morning um, to be joined by um, two of our uh, uh, favorite colleagues. But what I first want to just walk through are a couple ground rules. Um, we need you to uh, mute yourselves, um, please. Um, and the way in which we'll communicate um, is there's a chat function at the bottom of your screen. And some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with this. But in case you're not, um, it's down at the bottom. And it says chat. And you can type a message to everybody which I recommend um, so that they can see your question. And then I'll uh, be paying attention um, to the questions that are there. I've, I'm joined also by um, um, Katie and Mary from our uh, staff and the rest of our staff too, who will help me because I certainly don't know it all. We're recording the session and the slides will be available um, uh, on our website. And really what I'm hoping that we can accomplish here today is to share some um, learning and knowledge, but also then find out from you, how can we be a resource to you at this very uh, difficult, challenging um, time, unprecedented and challenging time. So I'm going to start out with that and then also um, end with that. So please help us fit, you know, learn how we can be a resource to you. I know lots of organizations out there are trying to be helpful. And while that's helpful, sometimes it's extremely confusing and, um, and uh, difficult. So with that, um, I'm going to get started here. Uh, we're very fortunate to be joined by Tom Harnish, who's the Vice President for Government Relations um, at SHIO, and um, by Daniel Dan Hurley, um, who's the CEO of the Michigan Association of State Universities. Uh, one of the things that we're hoping also is that we can get some ideas for the next session. I think in a, in a week or two, we're thinking of actually having a legislative specific um, type of briefing. And then um, we might have smaller gatherings that are more topic specific, maybe a group of folks in the Midwest who are really talking about how are you going to open in the fall. Um, we might double down on that particular topic or, you know, what does that schedule look like. Are you going to go on for six weeks and off for two weeks, you know, so that it, there's some flexibility. So that's part of what um, we're trying to accomplish today. Um, I think we're going to lead off uh, with um, Tom. Um, who's going to give us uh, a little perspective on um, the federal, uh, uh, what's going on at the federal level and how that affects our 12 fabulous Midwestern states. Um, and Mary and Katie, am I forgetting anything before we get started here? I think you're all good. All right, I'm going to mute myself and then um, I think what we'll do is we'll have Tom present and then after Tom finishes, we agreed that we'd have some question, time for questions and then Dan would um, present. Is that correct? R correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. I, I think that's correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. Awesome. All right. Take it away, Tom. Okay. Well, thank you, Susan. And thank you for the, uh, to the MEC team for, for organizing this. Uh, it's great to see everyone again. Um, I hope you all are, all are doing, uh, are doing well, uh, considering the, the circumstances. Uh, I'm Tom Harnish. I, uh, I'm at the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association. Uh, we are a national association uh, based in Boulder, Colorado, uh, representing state higher education uh, CEOs, agency leaders, system heads uh, around the country. Um, I am based here in Washington, D.C., but I am from uh, one of the fabulous MEC states, uh, the state of uh, Wisconsin. So, uh, and, and I worked at the MEC from uh, 2005 to 2007, and it really got me my start in uh, higher education. So I would like to talk uh, this morning about the, the federal response to uh, the COVID-19 and how it affects uh, the higher education environment. And so right now I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this um, works out here. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Yes, right. thank you. I'm gonna go into uh, view mode 
Yeah, I'm trying to get into to view mode here. Here we are. Uh, let's uh, view. Okay, just a second here. Okay, so we'll, we'll start from, here we go. So uh, if everybody can see that, that's a uh, uh, SHIO, um, the Mech Higher Education Policy Update. Um, SHIO, again, based in Boulder, Colorado, we've been uh, a presence in higher education for 66 years. Um, just a few months ago, we started our uh, Washington, D.C. office. So uh, we are getting more involved in uh, federal higher education policy. I think I know some of you from my days. I worked um, uh, 12 years at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, um, including with, with Dan Hurley here uh, for, for several years. Uh, so getting right into it um, with the, the higher education, uh, as many of you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not just the, the loss in um, state revenue that's, that's getting talked about certainly now, uh, but it's certainly the loss of, of, of revenue at the, the campus level. So um, we've seen significant losses in campus auxiliary revenues, so housing, um, refunds of dining fees, lost parking revenues, canceled events, um, increased costs, so not just lost revenue, but increased costs um, associated with the, the transition to, to online instruction, certainly, um, cost of, to move employees online, laptops, consultants, um, webcams and the like. Uh, I'm, I'm a little familiar with this about myself. I also kind of moonlight as a, uh, a college professor and I've had to, to handle, this, uh, handle this transition as well, um, like many other faculty members. Drops in research revenues, cleaning and sanitation costs. So there's significant costs associated um, with this pandemic as well as uh, losses in, in, in uh, expected uh, campus revenues. Um, including events like this summer. Uh, many people, you know, overlook the fact that many universities bring in uh, revenue from, from summer camps uh, and the, that revenue um, won't, be, won't be available this year. Certainly another issue uh, that is top of mind for people is the loss uh, of enrollment um, for both the summer term and uh, projected losses uh, for the fall. So uh, the higher education community has responded um, by petitioning the federal government with a unified plan. Um, and this was for, um, this is, we talked about the CARES Act, which, um, which you know, was signed by President Trump. Um, a higher, edu higher education community, public, private, uh, came together, um, including SHEO, on a unified plan um, to provide emergency aid and flexibility to colleges and universities. This unified plan consisted of four pillars, uh, emergency aid to students and institutions, access to low cost capital. So many institutions are um, particularly uh, smaller, uh, less endowed private institutions are, are facing um, uh, cash flow challenges, a technology implementation fund. So this would um, uh, be a, a bank of, of, of resources for the transition to, to uh, online instruction and then uh, temporary regulatory flexibility. And this is what we got out of it. Uh, we did get some money. Uh, this, and what came out of this was the CARES Act. Um, did we get some money? Yes. Um, but uh, it was not in any way commensurate with the, the costs uh, and lost revenue from um, this pandemic. And it really didn't touch on the issue of, of uh, state, um, state funding cuts uh, at all and the loss of state revenue. Did we get access to low cost capital? Kind of, there is uh, money in the, uh, the Small Business Administration um, for campuses with less than 500 employees um, that likely counts students. So we're talking about very small institutions might be able to access some SBA funds. We did not get a technology implementation fund, but we did get um, a temporary regulatory flexibility such as uh, compliance deadlines, things associated with the administration chiefly of a Title IV financial aid. So the CARES Act, um, the funding that, that went to education, um, $30.75 billion went to education with a state stabilization fund. 9.8% of it went to governors and 46.3% went to higher education. Now to break down that 46.3%, 90% of it was to, uh, by a formula uh, and that formula was 75% of relative share of uh, full-time equivalent Pell students, 
and 25% non-Pell students. So it's heavily weighted toward uh, the number of low-income students you have on campus. Remember, this is a direct aid to campus. So this bypasses states, goes right to campuses. At least 50% of this aid will have to be spent uh, on students through emergency grant aid. And then the remaining 10% um, went to institutions of higher education uh, under Title III, Title V, and Title VII of the Higher Education Act. And Title III and Title V refer to uh, minority serving institutions such as HBCUs, uh, Hispanic serving institutions and the like. Uh, of note for you, uh, the, the state legislators um, online today uh, is the magnets of effort provision. Uh, this bill did contain a magnets of effort provision. Uh, that uh, this magnets of effort provision um, requires that states maintain uh, their funding for both K-12 and higher education uh, at the average of the last three years um, to access the funds. Now, it's not all of the funds. You see the breakdown here with the 9.8% to governors, the money to K-12 and the money to higher ed. The magnets of effort provision only, uh, only applies to the money to governors and the money to K-12. The money to higher ed, it will go directly to institutions and will bypass states. So the money will go to institutions regardless of how much state funding there is. But the other two pots of funds um, are subject to a magnets of effort provision. However, with this magnets of effort provision, there is a waiver um, that states will, I'm guessing many, if not all states, um, will choose to um, file a waiver with the Department of Education, um, noting that a precipitous drop in uh, uh, available state revenue. And so they will be exempt from the magnets of effort provision. So there is uh, an escape hatch, so, so to speak, um, from this uh, magnets of effort provision. So this uh, chart right here is just the breakdown of funding. So about $14 billion will go directly to institutions of higher education. And that will be split um, with at least 50% going to students um, through emergency grant aid, and then 50% of two institutions. And then we have the 9.8% the to the governor's um, emergency education fund. So about $3 billion right there. And then the other parts, there are a variety of, of other provisions in uh, the CARES Act that apply to higher education. So um, uh, student loans will be suspended uh, until uh, September 30th. They will not provide student loan relief, so you'll still have to pay. Uh, you, the principal of your student loan will, will still be there, but you will not have any interest. Uh, there will be no penalties. There'll be no garnishments until um, September 30th of this year. Uh, there are, again, a variety of flexibilities on the administration of financial aid. Um, there is no tax relief in there for public universities. For paid sick and paid uh, for paid sick and family leave. So um, the the one of the previous stimulus uh, bills required extended um, leave related to coronavirus and paid uh, extended paid leave. Um, and private colleges will have uh, the availability of tax credits um, to offset the those costs. But um, for public universities and state entities, they will not receive that tax relief. Um, it's something that the public higher education community. Uh, we'll be definitely advocating for something that we have supported uh, in the uh, potential next uh, stimulus bill. And then there was um, uh, opportunities for increased charitable contributions. So um, the governor's education emergency fund, so $3 billion to governors. They can use this money on K-12, higher education, some blend of both. Um, this, this is $3 billion total, so it will be divvied up via a formula to states. Uh, they will have broad uh, latitude on how they use those funds. Um, this will be subject, again, to the magnets of effort requirement, um, and governors have a one year to use the funds. Uh, and this was opened up by the Department of Education uh, earlier this month. SHEO, um, for those of you who are uh, members of SHEO, we are um, requesting on information on how states plan to use and distribute these funds. Uh, if you are a higher education institution, or a higher education system, uh, now is the time to make the case uh, to your governor because they will be receiving this, these funds very soon if they haven't received them already. 
uh, to make uh, your case uh, to, uh, to receive these funds uh, with your governor's office. And then um, just to finish up here, the uh, CARES Act included a 15, uh, $14 billion to institutions. Again, not sub uh, subject to the magnets of effort. Um, and I, again, I broke down um, how it's going to be uh, distributed. The emergency grant aid to students, um, just so we're clear on this, this, this money cannot be distributed to students through their uh, student accounts. It cannot be used to offset balances uh, in their student accounts. It can only be distributed to students through checks, uh, debit cards, or electronic funds transfer. Uh, Institutions cannot use this money to reimburse themselves for refunds for housing and meal plans. Um, they can only reimburse themselves if they offered a, uh, a, a grant aid to students uh, in this modality after uh, March 27th, which was when the bill was signed into law. Uh, this uh, students must be Title IV participants to or Title IV eligible uh, to receive this aid. This means that undocumented students, DACA students, and international students are not eligible to receive this aid. Um, the students who are most advantaged to receive this aid are students who already have filled out the FAFSA and received aid um, because that just is a signal that they have um, checked all the boxes as far as a Title IV uh, eligibility is, is concerned. So those are some of the ground rules. Um, the Department of Education has a, a list of and an FAQ uh, on their website. I'd be happy to, to share it with you uh, about what the, the exact ground rules are as far as distributing this aid to students. Um, the, emer the other side of the, the, the coin uh, is the emergency grant aid to institutions. Um, the, this was just um, released this week. Um, this is funding um, for costs, institutional costs associated with significant changes of to delivery of instruction due to the coronavirus. Uh, it's the, so the secretary has encouraged institutions um, to use these funds for remote learning, strengthen IT capacity, uh, and training faculty and staff for remote learning. It can also be used um, if the institutions want to use it for uh, emergency student grant aid. Uh, and then finally, the, the stimulus four, um, we are uh, advocating um, on stimulus four, so we are uh, we are petitioning Congress. Um, the small business bill it looks like it's going to be passed soon. Um, that's basically the the, the loans that uh, businesses were drawing from that was running out of money. So that is expected to be passed soon. In May, when Congress comes back, uh, we expect them to take up another stimulus package. There is bipartisan support for a rescue package to states. So I know uh, Senator Cassidy, a Republican of, of Louisiana, and Senator Menendez um, voiced their support for a plan issued by the National Governors Association for $500 billion in aid um, to states. That's not $500 that's divvied up to K-12 and higher ed. This is just $500 or $500 billion to states um, and just to shore up um, their, um, uh, shore up their, their revenue um, deficits. And then what we have asked for at SHEO is $31.2 billion uh, in economic assistance to states uh, directly for, for higher education. And we've asked for other, um, uh, other uh, policy changes as well um, related to, to tax, credit, tax credits that I uh, described earlier, broadband extension, as well as um, uh, loans for nonprofit and public institutions um, from the Federal Reserve. And then uh, there, have been, uh, there have been a bevy of other um, issues uh, in higher education outside of uh, coronavirus, such as the Title IX rules, the Higher Education Act, which you know, I've gone to a few MEC meetings and discussed, that's pretty much on pause right now. Uh, then there's uh, certainly other issues such as visas being suspended um, and the like, um, and that can affect the uh, travel um, plans for international students. Uh, but with that, I'd be happy, um, uh, happy to answer any questions, but uh, turn it over to Dan. Um, with the with SHEO, um, we off, we do put out a daily email on uh, federal and state higher education policy that is available to everyone. If you if you're interested in signing up, 
um, just to follow the day-by-day -day changes in, in state and federal policy. So with that, I will turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. I think you'll need to unshare your screen. Oh, yes. And then I'll switch it over to mine. Okay, give me a second here. <clears throat> Just have a few slides, not as complex as uh, Tom's. But <clears throat> okay, uh, can people verify, can they see my screen? Yes. Oh, you can. You can see the slideshow. Uh, yep. But uh, if you're not in um, presentation mode, well, I think you need to. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got it, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from uh, Gray, Lansing, Michigan. Uh, I am pleased to report it's the first time in four days in uh, the third week of April that is not snowing. Um, Great to see so many friends and colleagues from uh, my home state of Michigan, but certainly throughout uh, the Midwest and next states. I wanna say thanks to uh, Susan and Mary and Katie and Jenny and the rest of the MEC gang for their uh, leadership during this time. Um, also want to uh, congratulate Tom on his new role. As he mentioned, I, uh, we had the pleasure of working together for about eight years in DC and it's great to see him in his new role and also uh, hats off to a uh, shield for bolstering its federal policy, federal relations work. Uh, hope you're all safe and healthy. Um, one thing I wanna do is just really uh, tee up a conversation. Um, and of course I'm speaking from a state higher ed perspective. Um, I'm gonna share some some observations uh, and then turn it over uh, back to Susan to uh, continue that conversation. So I uh, thought I would title my remarks, Navigating the Unknown, uh, Reaffirming the Mission of Higher Education. Um, how many times have we used the word unprecedented in the last uh, many, many weeks? Uh, and that continues to be the case uh, at times. Uh, surreal and a little sci-fi. Um, I do think from a, uh, at least from a high red leadership perspective, we have turned the corner on uh, kind of triaging the situation and are now uh, positioning ourselves to do some more mid and longer range scenario planning and continuity planning. But certainly priority number one is public health and safety. That conversation always needs to begin with that. And then, uh, of course, uh, maintaining the fundamental missions uh, that guides our work from a system perspective, uh, board or institutional. Um, but I would say, uh, I think we're gonna see as we look back, whenever that time is that we actually can look back on this, that there may be some uh, re reorientation of our missions. Uh, hopefully uh, never a wholesale uh, move away, but a reorientation uh, to reflect the new landscape for the workforce, the workplace, our economy, public health, et cetera. So Tom mentioned uh, many of the challenges that are out there. Um, you know, I, I didn't, necessarily think that I was going to experience another great recession. Um, uh, and yet uh, this already appears to be uh, making, you know, that having paling in comparison. Uh, you know, we are certainly so greatly appreciative of the federal support coming to higher education institutions and students. Uh, it's, it's despite the tens of billions is uh, uh, still unfortunately insufficient. And you look there, virtually every category of uh, revenue and assets uh, is poised uh, to take a huge hit. 
and that's very worrisome. Uh, top of mind outside of state funding is enrollment. And you see, you know, here in the Midwest, our biggest concern, of course, is just real uh, demographics, uh, the, the drying high school pipeline. Uh, that's probably fourth on the list now. Uh, we have uh, students and families' health concerns, uh, 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 which certainly is rational. Uh, international students, uh, we could be looking at essentially no new net international students uh, in this country and in the Midwest this fall, which just isn't an issue for the next academic year. That's a four-year hit uh, to uh, uh, budgeting. Um, certainly uh, uh, appropriate concern over families' ability to afford. Uh, here in Michigan, uh, as of today, we have a 24% unemployment rate. Can you imagine that? 24% of the workforce is filed for unemployment. Um, and we had a very strong economy uh, heading into this pandemic. Um, and then there's the whole issue of resource alignment, and that's really hitting home. Um, how do you align staffing at the uh, institutional level with the, the financial resources and at this moment in light of uh, diminished and certainly different, opera uh, different operating status? So uh, one very challenging financial puzzle to put together. And then what makes this so different and so frustrating, a little scary at times, is just the fact that there are so many unknowns. Um, Katrina was a horrible event, but it came and went and uh, the water went away and there was a cleanup. Here, we just have no idea what lies ahead here. Um, the level, the pace, the spread of the pandemic, is there gonna be a second, third, fourth wave of resurgent? If so, when might that happen? Um, for years and years, we will assess the economic and social trauma toll on, on us as a society and as a community. Um, and then, you know, every day by the hour, there are, are various things happening with the federal and state public policy responses to this. And some of it is reassuring, some of it is not, uh, and it kind of starts and goes and fits. And so uh, while we're all going about our work, trying to do the best job we can in planning, um, we're continuously monitoring uh, that response. Um, and you know, certainly one of the challenges, which is a big one, is what are the longer term threats to uh, the traditional higher education delivery model? Um, but with any uh, crisis, there are opportunities. Um, and I think one that is, uh, if it's not underway, I think it will be soon, and that is uh, institutional and or system redesign um, in terms of, and that could be viewed through many different lenses uh, across the, uh, the institutional enterprise. Obviously, first and foremost comes to mind is instructional delivery. And I think that uh, Midwest higher ed, American higher ed has done a real good job. Um, you know, in our, um, in Michigan, uh, in the space of 10 hours and one day in mid-March, our university has converted to online and they've done a remarkable job since then. Um, um, but there, I think, is gonna be a longer term uh, uh, changes in that delivery model. Uh, already, as we all look to this fall um, and, and what the continuity planning is gonna involve, uh, conversations are coming to the fore in terms of the academic calendar. Uh, we are reminded that our calendar is based on a 1700s agrarian model, and, and maybe, just maybe, now is the time to explore uh, changing that. Um, if not on an interim basis, on a longer term basis. And then if there, you know, there will be a time when students will come back to campus. Um, but uh, when that happens, um, uh, you know, it's not gonna be like turning the clock back to the day prior to the pandemic hit. And I think that certainly uh, along with the model or an aspect of that is how to promote um, on-campus learning that, that um, provides for uh, physical social distancing. 
Um, act, or it's just not about the uh, uh, teaching and learning model. Uh, there's a significant opportunity within student services redesign. Um, it's remarkable how uh, the universities, again, um, from you know the 15 universities that comprise the uh, coordinating board that is our association, they've done a remarkable job delivering student services, whether it's student mental health or financial aid or whatnot, um, virtually. Um, and again, I think there's some opportunity to do some more permanent redesign. Um, I, in talking with uh, university officials, uh, they probably had more contacts from uh, uh, vendors in the last month than in the last year. And uh, that does, uh, you know, uh, foreshadow some potentially strong public private partnerships. And then of course, um, there absolutely is a need for institutional and system efficiencies. So um, just a couple of observations to, in, in terms of some, um, as uh, CHEO uh, staff, agency staff, association staff, uh, legislators, um, where there's an opportunity for leadership. Um, and these are just some of the things that we're doing here in Michigan, but I would imagine it's taking place across the Midwest states. So one is certainly advocacy and coordination around federal and state resource support. We have a great uh, regional groups like MEC and the, the national groups like SHEO, but we certainly need to serve as a conduit to those groups and with our congressional delegations uh, to support that work. And obviously a real strong line of communication with our, our own legislators and, and gubernatorial administrations. Another area is helping our institutions navigate. And there is a lot of rough water to navigate. So one of the things we're doing, for example, is we have uh, virtual standing uh, meetings with probably eight or nine uh, 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 vice presidential groups on a weekly basis and engaging uh, university presidents on an ongoing basis and, um, you know, providing an update to them, uh, serving as a conduit, again, with legislative leadership, uh, the governor's office, uh, a little update on what we're hearing on Washington, D.C., but a lot of it is just opening up, doing exactly what uh, Susan and company are doing right now, and that is fostering peer-to-peer -peer inquiry, and I think that's really important at the time. And then also actually hitting those uh, key topics, what are our institutions doing in terms of program delivery, student services, staffing operations, et cetera. And then um, I think right now we're seeing a lot of pivot again to the, I used to think it's longer term, it's certainly every day, it's becoming uh, uh, closer in the mirror and that is continuity planning, uh, especially for this fall semester. Uh, looking at all the areas across the university enterprise, public health, edu obviously educational delivery, the research enterprise, finance, facilities, computing, athletics, etc. cetera. Um, and then again, um, you know, how are universities going about that, uh, looking at that from a framework of uh, the model, the academic model, timeline, et cetera. Um, and by the way, I, I do, I, you see a state ecosystem, uh, you know, we all operate in our own state environments. Uh, uh, Michigan is a very decentralized environment. Uh, uh, so we're not systematized, but we do have a very strong ecosystem of post-secondary education. Uh, other things uh, that are, uh, I trust taking place uh, in our SHIO roles is uh, to facilitate collaboration among all stakeholders. Um, uh, we've been very proud here in Michigan to, to collaborate across the sectors and with K-12, uh, with the administration, and uh, there has, uh, I had been bragging pre-pandemic about that level of collaboration. It's probably tripled in the last six weeks. Uh, around the clock, uh, every day, there is just remarkable strong um, uh, liaisoning with uh, all of those actors, and we're all it needs to happen, and, and frankly, uh, I'll admit, I'm, I'm leaning on a lot of shoulders at this moment, uh, gaining as much insight and guidance as I can. Um, another opportunity is to uh, quantify the pandemic's impact on the institutions of higher education. We're seeing that out of uh, various, I think Wisconsin, for example, has a talking point within their system. Um, and um, um, in, in our state, uh, we've done a little bit of that. Um, uh, hats off to the independent sector in our state. They have uh, 
quantified uh, darn near to the penny uh, the tremendous impact the pandemic has had. And I think that's helpful to convey to uh, lawmakers and the public just how uh, uh, impactful this has been. Uh, one aspect that has been warming uh, to me has been promoting, coordinating the stewardship role of higher ed's response to the pandemic. And it really, you know, you're hearing the stories and it is just heartwarming what uh, faculty, staff, uh, researchers, obviously frontline healthcare professionals, our nurses, our doctors, um, uh, you name it, are doing to help uh, respond. Um, and then where there is also already uh, a, a, a positioning, we, this will end, again, we don't know when, but um, I think it's important already at this moment to position uh, higher ed institutions as the post, the primary post-pandemic recovery accelerators. Um, we have millions of people that we are going to need to, uh, 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 adults, we we'll call them working adults, maybe they aren't working, but who need to upskill who are either unemployed or underemployed. And then, you know, use this pandemic as yet another lens as a reminder of the importance of maintaining all of our state's uh, post-secondary attainment agendas. Um, we all know uh, uh, the importance of that. And I think looking at the economic data that is sure to come out, that there, while every sector occupation income class is getting hit hard by the pandemic, that there will be a correlation that those with a higher level of attainment will have greater job security and job uh, mobility. Um, and then certainly a, a foundational theme through all of our work is to maintain and strengthen academic quality, access to college, and very importantly, equity um, in access uh, in, to college and uh, post-secondary participation and completion. So uh, with that, so those are just a few uh, observations from uh, here uh, in, in uh, Michigan. Um, but uh, what we really, we're certainly, uh, said I'll turn over to Susan here in a second to, uh, uh, you know, continue the conversation, whether it's federal policy or uh, state or institutional leadership uh, opportunities here, but certainly would love to know how MEC can help. Um, they've been doing wonderful work uh, in their current portfolio of products and services, but are, are there other programs or services that they can uh, uh, boost even further now? Are there new temporary efforts that they should consider? And what's the best way, uh, is there a role for them to foster more informal peer-to-peer -peer inquiry with various uh, subsets of the MEC population across the Midwest state, uh, states. So with that, thanks again, and I'll turn it over to you, Susan. Thank you both, that was really interesting. Um, just a reminder, uh, we will be posting the presentations um, on our MEC website, and I think we're trying to figure out is there an opportunity then, you know, to continue um, the, the potential to ask questions and share best practices and ideas on our website so that this just doesn't sort of stop here. Um, I see a number of questions popping up um, uh, in the queue here on the chat function. So make sure you open it up and you'll be able to see uh, the questions from everyone. So what I'm going to do is um, just highlight the questions and then um, ask for either Tom um, or Dane to um, respond. I think the two of you have agreed you could stick around a little longer till 1015, our formal central time. Our formal stop time is 10 central, but um, I think these guys are willing to stick around if you've got some additional questions. Is that right? Yes. Yep. yep. Right. Um, so, but, 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 like I said, we'll present the presentations. We're really trying to figure out, you know, we're not trying to boil the ocean, but how do we help? Um, and uh, we really want to get your ideas. Um, um, Senator uh, Zay from Indiana, you can see that I've now moved to Indiana from um, Pierce, South Dakota. Um, the beautiful stained glass uh, Capitol dome behind me. Those of you who know me know that I will pause during all of our state visits and take a snapshot of the interior dome of our capitals with the exception of North Dakota. And I have a, I usually take a picture of um, something fabulous in the Capitol there, but that's what's behind me. So- We welcome you as, a, uh, as an interim Hoosier. <laughs> oh, it's so great to see everybody. This is wonderful. Um, so, um, uh, from Chris Hyde, um, Chris has asked, um, and I'm going to take these in order. Um, uh, 
uh, Betsy DeVos has said that schools have wide latitude in how the money is spent. And I think there's this sort of second round that was just announced um, day before yesterday. Um, how can folks figure out and know where that money, how that money is being distributed and what schools are getting the funds? What's the distrib distribution? Do either of you have a response to that? Yep, and, and Chris, that's a great question. Um, on the department's website, and I'd be happy to, to share it, uh, the link with uh, Susan and the team and make sure that everybody gets it. Um, the department has done the calculations. Um, it's based on the formula um, of the 75% of the Pell FTE student and 25% non-Pell FTE student. Um, and so it, it's based on that, uh, that formula. And then the, the Department of Education has done a, a calculation of that and put together a PDF of all of the institutions and, and how much money each institution will get. So I'd be happy to send along that PDF um, right after we're done here. Great, thanks, Tom. And I'm gonna keep muting myself in between because I have a cardinal right outside my window that is um, loud. Uh, next question um, comes from Teresa Lubbers. Um, are any states looking at a partnership relationship between K-12 and higher ed and making recommendations for the allocation of dollars under the governor's discretionary fund? Right, well, I, I would actually turn this, um, I, I've heard of this and I see you know, Rob is, is uh, chimed in with uh, that Tennessee and, and Blake Flanders has, has uh, said that um, Kansas uh, has a partner relationship. Um, I, I've heard that states are, uh, some states are going in this direction so there isn't um, sort of um, conflict between K-12 and higher ed that they're kind of on the same page as far as uh, a, a presentation to the governor's office. Um, but I would actually turn that question out um, to the audience and say, you know, from, from in your state, you know, how, have, how do you plan to go about this and, and what's your strategy for these funds? Uh, Tom, um, and hi there, Teresa. Uh, I would just say here in Michigan, one thing that we did is uh, collaborated at the uh, post-secondary level with the, the community colleges, the independent colleges, and uh, uh, with the latter, we teamed up and uh, sent off a recommendation to the administration, gubernatorial administration, uh, a couple of days ago, um, recognizing that speed was important in terms of distribution of dollars. And we put forward a recommendation for the uh, governor to allocate the, the uh, uh, emergency education relief funds on a per student basis across K-12 and higher education and provided based, you know, on uh, federal data, what that allocation breakdown would be uh, for K-12 for the, uh, uh, all the uh, public and independent two and four year colleges in the state. Um, certainly uh, we had some support from uh, some K-12 actors in the state, but we didn't, you know, do the full, uh, it wasn't an in-depth set of conversations again because we thought uh, speed mattered, but that's one arguably uh, rational, rational, equitable approach to a distribution framework. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, Susan, uh, this is Devendra Malhotra from Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Um, we in Minnesota, we got together with the University of Minnesota and we put together a joint proposal and sent it to the governor. Uh, I think um, in our converse, we are, we are conversing with uh, K-12, but not around uh, the allocation formula for these, these funds, but generally in terms of um, uh, uh, the academic continuity piece, what is happening at K-12, what do we need to do, how we can uh, accommodate the incoming class, because there are disruptions there too. But it's difficult to have that conversation between higher ed and K-12 because our business models are fundamentally different. Uh, and particularly the pandemic, um, I mean, it has impacted K-12 too, but there are these substantial losses in revenue, particularly as they relate to tuition and fee, they are missing in the K-12 arena. And, and so the traditional element, uh, the traditional, um, sort of reaction uh, at the policy level is to allocate these funds in the same proportion as the general allocation occurs between K-12 and higher ed. And, and so in that chatter, you know, we are trying to break that, that you should also look at the differential impact which has occurred in the short run because 
because even though the CARES Act is called the stimulus package, it's really a recovery package for the time being. And, and so that's just some thoughts from uh, the way uh, we are approaching it. Thank you, Devinder. Um, I have a, a question in the queue here um, from Mike Duffy. Um, hi, Mike. Uh, uh, Mike's um, hey guys. commissioner and with the Ohio Department of Education, Higher Education and in the thick of it. So um, Mike's wondering if Tom can explain how the federal funds can be used as related to providing liquidity to um, higher ed institutions struggling to get cash. For example, could Ohio use federal funding as collateral essentially to incentivize local banks to extend low interest or zero interest loans to IHEs and then write off losses as grants or, or for whatever gets repaid, revolving that into grants for IHEs. Then we as states can provide guidelines for who gets it. This might leverage a small amount of federal funding for a larger pool. Um, big question, kind of detailed. Um, Tom or Dan? I'll go take, take yeah, a yeah, I, 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 um, um, I just, I haven't seen that, Mike. I'm not, you know, not saying that it, it can't happen or it won't happen. Um, I haven't seen that yet. Um, I just know that the law for this um, particular distribution of aid, um, certainly they're very uh, particular about how the student aid gets uh, distributed. Um, and as far as the institutional aid, um, the, the law says that, that that aid needs to be used uh, directly for expenses related to coronavirus. Um, that said, you know, money is, is fungible to a certain extent. Um, so um, we would see, but I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I just don't know enough about that and see if, if institutions have, have gone down that route yet. But um, that's uh, what, the, what the law says as far as this uh, distribution of, of federal funds uh, are concerned. Um, it, and perhaps with the, the governor's fund, um, there could be, you know, again, opportunities there um, with an infusion of cash um, to be used for, for collateral. But I, I haven't seen that yet. But again, I don't know that that hasn't happened. Thanks for that question. Um, Chris Hyde's noting that he found the allocation PDF and he shared it with everybody in the chat function. One thing I don't know is when we go, is this chat, chat function gone or are these questions preserved so that, that, you know, we can respond to them or highlight them later on? Um, I think it's recorded, so we, we will be able to keep that. But I, I want to, yeah, I will great. look around for for um, for information on that. That's a really great question. That's great. Um, I don't see any questions in the queue yet, but I am going to ask one myself um, because yesterday I saw something um, with the most recent um, announcement from the Federal Department of Ed that community colleges are saying saying that they were left out. I don't know if either of you saw that. Um, but uh, that, was a, that was something that I saw and I wondered um, if you had heard the same and if you have a response to that. That, that community colleges were left out of the CARES Act? Yeah, that there wasn't sort of the same, that, that there was some sort of dissimilar mm -hmm. um, statement or application. I'd read that and I wasn't oh. sure what was true or and if so, whether, what you thought about. So, oh, can I jump in? This is Jenny. Um, I think, I think what Susan might be talking about is the fact that the formula used FTEs rather than unduplicated headcount. So I don't know if you wanted to talk about that, Tom, but I think that's yeah. what you meant, Susan. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the funding is not based on just the, 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 the raw number of students that you have, but rather full-time equivalent students. So uh, community colleges have a significant number of, of part-time students. So in that respect, they, they, are, they are disadvantaged, certainly. Part-time students um, will have uh, uh, plenty of needs too um, in this uh, emergency environment. So yes, in that in that respect, that they counted full-time students instead of the the raw number of students. Uh, community colleges are at a disadvantage. Um, so so yeah, that that would be my response to that. Uh, Bill Pink, um, hi Bill, um, in Michigan. Uh, has asked Tom, uh, Tom and Dan, of course, um, since the CARES Act guidelines missed a vital need of higher ed budget stabilization, will SHEO and others make a hard push to have this allowable and stimulus for, and can MEC play a role in advocacy? Um, you know, we have to walk a fine line with respect to advocacy, but I think we're in a different environment right now, so absolutely, but um, we're going to be thinking about that and talking about how to do that. But Tom or Dan, um, to Bill's point, um, do you have thoughts on that? Well, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Tom. And you had mentioned that, um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, a uh, stimulus for or CARES Act to a request of what, 46.6 .6 billion. 
um, uh, you know, being led by, uh, you know, the, the, the DC organizations. And so, again, we're, uh, I think that's one of those topics that is, uh, you know, there's uh, different opinions uh, on Capitol Hill on um, the need for that, the timing for that, but I think we should all uh, be playing a role for certainly when it comes to advocacy. Great. Yeah, I would just say that um, Geo is pushing for uh, $31 billion in direct aid to states for public higher education. Um, I know some of the other associations, particularly the private associations, uh, want us to continue on uh, more the institutional route. So similar to, to this CARES Act, there was a stream of revenue to governors for um, educational priority, and then there was the stream of money directly to institutions. Certainly the, the private colleges would be more interested in, um, uh, in aid directly to, to, to institutions. Um, but um, that, um, and then we got to that 31, just so you know how we got to that 31 um, a billion dollar figure, uh, we, those are based on projections. All, all of the, the association's advocacy efforts are, are certainly based on projections. Um, and that's based on 10% um, mid-year cuts, the, the chance of up to 20% um, cuts for next year's um, state budgets, uh, as well as uh, cuts in state financial aid and um, an increased demand for, for state financial aid. So that's how we got to the $31 billion uh, uh, estimate. That is a conservative number. That does not include uh, all of the, the costs associated with um, the coronavirus, with all the lost revenue, with all the increased um, online instructional costs. So it's a, it's a conservative number, um, but uh, we think it's a, it's a reasonable approach uh, in, our, in our ask for Congress. Thank you. Um, one of the things I just wanted to mention is we've looked at at NEC at um, putting a federal letter together. We've got a draft, um, but you know things keep changing. So um, I just want you all to know that that's something that we're looking at. And I know that um, our uh, sister um, compact in the Northeast has produced such a letter. Shio has, um, and I don't know if the other. I don't think the other two compacts have yet, but we're looking at that. Um, one of the things I wanted to just um, ask is I see we have some governor's folks on the phone and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I know some of you, you know, Teresa, you're, you know, you um, lead kind of a cabinet level, you know, um, you know, higher ed organization. I see there's some other governor's advisors on the phone. Are there any um, questions you have for us or is there any, anything we can do to be helpful as you try to think about sort of your role and partnership um, with respect to higher education? And how can we be helpful? Because I know some of these funds, I know, Tom, you mentioned that um, now that, was it Dan or Tom? I think it was Tom talking about now is the time um, to talk with governors about that. I think it was the 9.8% federal yep. money. Can the you know, $3 billion. Because I think that's where we sort of come together too. Yep. yep. And that's, that's the money that's uh, going out soon if they haven't received it already. Um, and uh, that's, that would be the, be the time for advocacy on that would be right now. And that's money that's going to states to governors, correct? It is going directly to, to governors, yeah. yes. Okay, thanks. I'd make a couple comments. One, I think it's an opportunity uh, for us to really double down on showing the value in a broad way of higher education, how, it's, uh, how higher education is improving communities, economic development opportunities. So we're collecting, and I'm sure all of you are as well, information about what our colleges and universities are doing to help the economy. And that sort of pivots to the other part I would say is, you know, we can't be deaf to this conversation about, especially in the Midwest, as I look at Michigan and Indiana and other states about the unemployment rates, we're gonna be at 500,000 new unemployment people on the roll soon. And what's our offer to help people? So we are working very intentionally in the governor's workforce cabinet to actually prepare people for completing a, credentials, starting a credential, really aligning uh, in a much uh, uh, in a much broader way this relationship between higher learning and the economy and opportunity. So I think while we certainly need to use this as an opportunity to promote higher education and our budgets, we also need to do this in a much more nuanced way around value in a broader way. Thank you, Teresa. 
Uh, hi, this is Brandy. Uh, I am uh, Governor Whitmer's Education Policy Advisor, and I don't know if I have any specific requests um, from MEC that would be helpful, but I just was going to reiterate some of the things that um, Dan has said. Uh, we have never worked more closely together. Uh, I literally talk uh, and text and email and Zoom Dan uh, every single day, uh, probably multiple times a day. I see Dave Eisler, President Eisler, and President Bill Pink. Um, the same can be said of some of our individual presidents. Um, I think that this has really helped us coordinate better uh, with each other and just shared information and really leaned on each other for resources. And so, you know, if this can be used as an opportunity really to build relationships with your governor's office, I certainly would recommend that. And, um, you know, to Teresa's point, obviously thinking about budget, um, and uh, revenue shortfalls is really important. And we talk about that all the time, but we also talk about other issues. So, um, you know, sorry to put President Eisler on the spot, but I, you know, at the very beginning of the crisis, he had a whole group of students stuck in the country of Peru that couldn't get back. And so he called me and I worked with our federal affairs office to work with the Department of State to help Dave students and faculty get back safely on a plane and it was an ordeal and the governor wanted a daily update about how those Ferris State students uh, were doing and every single day she asked us on our evening call how are those kids doing and it made her um, you know really um, realize some of the um, parts of this crisis that weren't immediately on the surface. Um, I had a president uh, call me the other day to say, you know, because graduation has mm -hmm. been postponed um, or canceled, we are mailing packages to every single student with their diploma in a, in a nice um, portfolio, um, and we are going to include their tassels if they earned them, and we want to make it special. Could the governor do um, a letter uh, to each student? And so we did that, and so every Grand Valley State University student is going to get a letter from the governor saying congratulations and thank you for jumping into the economy. We need you more than ever. Um, she's going to do a video for the doctors and nurses that are graduating. I worked really closely with higher ed um, to issue some executive orders and executive directives related to early licensing for those that were graduating from the health professions. So um, nurses and doctors, we, we worked on getting them uh, graduated back, you know, basically at the very end of March so that they could be licensed April 1, so they could go join the front lines at our hospitals in Detroit. Um, and so we're doing a video to, with the MSU graduates of those health professions. Um, so there's just all sorts of um, ways, you know, obviously I think the recommendations on Gear Act have been helpful, um, but I think that there's all sorts of uh, ways, especially because governors have been so, um, and I will say particularly Governor Whitmer right now has been very much, um, you know, seen as leaders in our country right now in this moment. It's such a great way to plug in with your advisors. Hi, um, this is Suzanne Morris from Illinois. Um, I'm on the community college board in Illinois. And I think some, you know, community college enrollment pretty much tracks with unemployment. So when unemployment is high, our enrollment goes up. Also, I think with um, not instability, but people not sure what's gonna happen on their campuses, we might see some students who would normally go to um, go away to school, want to stay closer to home, considering what's, if, if there's some, you know, stress or, or concern about whether or not the campus is going to be open, if it will stay open for the whole semester. So I think for community colleges, the issue is going to be increased enrollment, not a de decrease in enrollment. So that's just a little different take, I think, than um, the four-year universities and private colleges might face. Thanks, Suzanne. I have a couple um, questions in the queue here, and I'm going to um, read them out. I know that we've agreed we are stop times right now, but um, um, Tom and Dan have generously agreed to stay with us till about 10:15 Central Time. Um, but I got a couple um, com questions here or comments. Um, 
are we seeing any trends yet or indications that um, rural states and colleges are going to see a countervailing enrollment trend? Um, the movement of students from large campuses and urban areas to smaller rural campuses close to home. Um, uh, that comes from uh, Mark uh, Hegrot in North Dakota. Are there of you hearing anything about that? So, yeah, I, that question right now is certainly being asked a lot. I don't have uh, any definitive data on the ground here in Michigan, um, but uh, you know, I think there one, and it might have been one of my bullet points. I think there is uh, that's one perspective uh, trend, and uh, another one is out of uh, maybe public health safety concerns that families may have, maybe students have, is just to stay closer to home, and so maybe to attend a community college, uh, that might be one. And then, uh, you know, we've been seeing, you've been seeing a lot of, of uh, comments uh, recently about um, if uh, uh, colleges are not uh, open on campus in the fall, are students gonna wanna pay uh, a higher tuition rate uh, for online classes? And so those are, are other factors at play and a concern. We have some schools that actually admits are up. Uh, others, I'm sure that that might not be the case. Um, but uh, that that is one concern out there is what's going to happen. Uh, what's the reaction going to be if uh, classes are, you know, uh, online or delayed or whatnot? Thank you. Um... Dan, you know, one of the things, Brandy, that I was reminded of when you were speaking is just that human connection. And, you know, um, we're all missing that, or many of us are missing that, um, introverts and extroverts. Uh, but I'm thinking about it in our own family. Both of our kids are home. One's a college sophomore um, who was in Los Angeles in college, and the other one is a high school senior. And yesterday, um, our son got a video from all the teachers at his school uh, or uh, who teach the seniors. And then a sign showed up in our front yard supporting um, in support of him and the other seniors. So I think that outreach, that connection um, is something also that um, we can't forget about that's so meaningful. A couple other points in the queue here. Um, Mike Cartney um, from South Dakota has um, said he thinks it'd be helpful for MEC to start thinking about how colleges will work in the new environment, maybe starting in the fall. What are some of the best practices from safety perspectives when students do return? And how do we capitalize on what we've learned through this event to improve how we deliver? And I, I think that's spot on, Mike. It's how do, how do we think about this as an opportunity as difficult as it is? <clears throat> Um, from Gary um, uh, in Ohio, um, do we expect for students to look at transform, uh, transferring from main campuses to smaller regional campuses, smaller populations? Oh, that's very similar to Mark's question. So thanks. I don't think, I think Dan touched on that, but that certainly is something that we should take a look at. I think Julie Underwood, I saw her on the call earlier, um, and I think you're still there, Julie had asked us, you know, could we or some other entity look at some economic forecasting or modeling. You know, what is this going to look like demographically? Do we have any thoughts um, about that as we move forward? Yeah, Susan, I would just comment on on the uh, Michael's uh, uh, suggestion, and certainly we're seeing, uh, you know, in national uh, media um, some discussion on on best practices and think tanks and, and uh, for-profit entities are doing that, but I think it might be helpful, at least I find here in Michigan, that we certainly want to learn from uh, other out-of-state actors, but I think we're often more comfortable with, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer. what are you doing uh, uh, down the street at the other institution? And so one thing where MEC could be helpful is keeping an eye on uh, institutional system or state uh, coordinating or governing board actions with regard to best practices uh, for uh, you know the, the longer term, uh, whether it's continuity planning, uh, the the restart, however, how, whatever form that takes, um, and whether it's being you know, we're talking about institutional practice or whatnot certainly around safety, public health and safety on mm -hmm. campus, so all who touch it, uh, students, staff, uh, visitors, uh, but then also uh, maybe other categories, uh, educational delivery model, um, college athletics is a fascinating conversation. And so um, I think it would be more meaningful to have a portfolio of those practices and policies from an from a American Midwest uh, perspective. 
thank you. We are um, trying to encourage everybody, um, rather than unmuting yourself, um, to using the chat functions. And I'm reading, I think you can all, uh, this every, everybody gets these, um, um, kind of this queue up on the side here. We've got about uh, maybe seven or so minutes left. Other pressing questions or things that folks um, would like to hear about, either they wanna share or they'd like to have Dan and Tom respond to, or that you'd like us to look at. I know that um, sort of this analysis piece, um, I've gotten some, we've gotten some support for that concept. Um, and so we may be looking at a partnership there. Um, the, the cool thing I think about the Midwest is we actually are a census region. It's not something that I knew before. And when I was on my visits, Rob and I were looking at what, where did the term Midwest come from? It's actually Middle West. So we're the Middle West, um, which got shortened to be the Midwest. And so since we're a census region, I think maybe, maybe there's a piece of that um, that makes it easier for us to do some forecasting um, with respect to the region as a whole. We know the edges are different um, and we love that, but um, perhaps there's something we can do with that. Any other questions for Dan and Tom at this point in time? Any thoughts or suggestions for us? Great. So um, I think as I said at the beginning, um, what we're trying to do is, you know, we want to be helpful, not a, uh, not a problem, you know, because of course it's easy to overhelp, right? And you're all, we're all getting bombarded with, you know, webinars and advice and counsel and vendors and all sorts of things are, are kind of, uh, it's a vortex, right? Um, at, at points, but I think we're trying to figure out what's the best role for the compact and how can we be of service to you? So we'll put this on our website. We're gonna try to figure out a way that we can um, allow for your thoughts and ideas um, to be shared. I think our next step is figuring out um, what, do we do another of these? And if so, is it the same group or do we sort of dive in more deeply into a topic where we might partner with somebody else. I talked about the possibility of what is the fall going to look like? Um, what are some of the different models that people are thinking about, both public and private institutions? And um, uh, we might actually have a session um, in partnership with CSG and um, NCSL. Uh, we're talking with folks about doing a, a Midwest, um, Midwestern legislative um, call like this um, that could be pretty interesting, hopefully featuring a couple of our higher ed finance um, chairs. Um, from both parties. So uh, with that, um, unless there's a closing question, oh, I see something from Gary here, um, Gary Cates. Um, any thoughts about what new credentials might be needed um, it, with respect that are uh, to health and safety for businesses to comply with possible new regulations like COVID compliance positions? I don't know if there's an answer for that today, but that's a great um, point and question, Gary. Uh, yeah, Dan here. I don't have an answer for that, but that's it's uh, commendation for asking that question. And, and as soon as I get off um, uh, he, uh, with this conversation, I'm going to be picking up the phone and talking with folks with our uh, State Department of Labor and Economic uh, Opportunity uh, to, because uh, I know they're reaching out to me uh, uh, with a similar type thing. How can, to my prior point earlier, uh, we need to position ourselves now to help uh, our states, our communities, our people, our society um, uh, restart and, and that alignment of uh, uh, credentials, especially those that are short term credentials. Um, how can we get those uh, uh, in the marketplace responsive to uh, labor market demand, uh, state demand, uh, and get those uh, ready to go. Thanks for that question, Gary, and um, thanks for the response there, Dan. Um, so are there any other um, questions or thoughts before I um, kind of close this out and thank our guests and all of you? All right, so I've joined you from, um, oh, Tom, do you have a question or a point? No? I'm good, thank you. Okay, so I've joined you from our home in St. Paul, Minnesota, but also from the capitals, um, the interior domes of um, uh, Missouri, um, South Dakota, and Indiana, Indianapolis, <laughs> Indiana, Indianapolis. Um, so uh, like I said earlier on, those of you that know me, I take pictures of the interior domes of the places that have capitals that actually have interior domes. And so um, that's my, uh, that's typically my background, but I just want to express my gratitude to Tom and to Dan for the for being with us today for this sort of maiden voyage, our first 
Zoom um, group call. Uh, we're, I'm fairly new at this, um, but my entire family, we're all sharing our house here. Um, we're all Zooming at once. And I've asked, I asked them to kind of hold the band with this morning for mom. Um, but uh, we'll keep you posted um, on our website and um, provide resources as, as necessary and, and um, help uh, be clear about sort of the next steps we're thinking about. Um, but we're really grateful to all of you for the time you've taken today. We're a unique organization, you know. Um, we're regionally focused and um, we're blessed with a combination of policymakers um, and higher ed leaders and everything um, in between. And I really um, am just feel so fortunate to be able to work with all of you. So thank you and um, we'll, be, we'll be together soon. Thank you so much. It was great. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a good, safe day.